Well, thank you very much, Brian. That was a very interesting talk. Um, a lot of stuff in there that I had come across before, so that's very good research and very well done. Uh, I think I'm going to take a completely different uh, view on it, or a different perspective on the whole thing. And while it's centred on Chum, really, historiography is what, I, what I'm going to show you, is that how it has failed, in particular in regard to Chum. There's an old maxim in history which goes that history is written by the victors. Accordingly, it is their point, written from their point of view, the motive is the justification for their actions and to vilify their foe. Such histories are never a true and impartial record of events. Moreover, political activists of all hues and creeds weaponize history and use it to attack their opponents. Historical truth in such battles is of little consequence. Moreover, the people can, con moreover, people can consciously bias history, but it also can be influenced accidentally through subconscious biases of the historian. Consequently, historians are trained in a number of strategies to get rid of the lies, mistakes and biases from the historical narratives. Accordingly, falsehoods are nothing new and are so prevalent within the domain of history that quality historical writing requires that falsehoods be filtered out using quality control procedures. In history, historiography is the term given to this quality control method. It's what historians like to call the history of history. In effect, it is asking the questions, who wrote what? Is it a valid representation of historical events? Is there corroborating evidence from independent and diverse sources? And are the sources of the information authentic? Why is it necessary? Believe it or not, the human mind can make many knowledge, knowledge processing errors. Accordingly, all academic disciplines and all areas in the area of human intellectual endeavor have in place quality control methods to reduce the effects of these errors or cognitive biases to give them their technical term. These quality control mechanisms can fail from time to time. And it is the embarrassing failure of Irish historiography, which I will set out to investigate, which I set out to investigate a number of years ago, using this little word, why? Why has it failed? History can only stand as valid if it can withstand critical evaluation. The word critical literally means to find fault with something. I realise that the philosophy of arriving at historical truths is more than a bit academic or highfalutin. Moreover, as you all, all you need to know is that history is often weaponized. It is difficult to understand because a lot of the background information needs to be absorbed and that takes time. Accordingly, misunderstandings are common and experts are needed to raise awareness and expose the falsehoods. From this point forward, I am not going to mention the word histori historiography. Instead, I will attempt to explain it, how, uh, explain it, how it has failed and you, by using some practical examples. It requires us to take a journey a long way from Chum, with the express aim to expose the, the chief foundation stones upon which the false history surrounding the Chum children's home and the many other recent historical fallacies rest. I will attempt it as a quiz, but don't worry, I'm not going to ask you all questions individually. Here you go. See if you can recognise what links all these pioneering scientists together. And I'll just go through the slideshow now. This is one of my favourite people of all time. Lazaro Spallanzani. He was the first man to uh, use in vitro fertilisation, or to come up with in vitro fertilisation. In vitro means in the glass, not in utero, which is in the womb. Uh, so, and he was also a pioneer of echolocation by bats. Eugenio Barsanti. He was the inventor of the first internal combustion engine. Giovanni Caselli, inventor of the fax machine. Now immediately you're thinking they're all Italian, uh, but just to fool you, here's a French person. Jean-Antoine Nollet, he discovered the osmosis in membranes. Have you heard of him? Giovanni Baptiste Venturi, every mechanic has heard of the Venturi effect, it's used in carburetors. Uh, it's named after this man. He was also the first man to discover the scientific works of Leonardo da Vinci, and he published them in 1798. Up to that point, Leonardo was only known as an artist. So Venturi features prominently there. René Just Hoy was the father of crystallography. In science, he's regarded as the, the father of that. And here's the most famous scientist in the world that you've never heard of, Albert Einstein. No, it's the man beside him. Georges Lemaitre. He was the man who came up with the Big Bang Theory. 
Einstein was one of his biggest supporters, and here they are the pictures at a conference, a science conference. And this man, Gabriel Fallopio, the fallopian tubes are named after him. They carry his name. Now here's the big reveal. The big reveal? What connects them all together? They're all Catholic priests. How many feminists would be able to tell you that the female sexual organs are named after a Catholic priest? Now the reason I mention that, go back there. Almost every possible science publication, every popular science publication today, claims that the Catholic Church hated science. This has been repeated in a plethora of books, including A Brief History of Time by Stephen Hawking. And its view was supported by atheist evangelists like Carl Sagan and his reincarnation, Neil deGrasse Tyson, and many more. It gets repeated on television programmes over and over again, even by our own Irish educated physics graduate, Darrow Green. It's not true, of course, and the evidence to support to trounce it is abundant, and it's a well-known falsehood within the community of science historians. O'Brien, Hawking, and others are simply repeating a common falsehood based on the prejudices of the society which they grew up in. It is an anti-Catholic falsehood, part of a much wider pantheon of myths commonly found in Protestant lands. However, O'Brien grew up in a Catholic society and received a Catholic education. Why is he repeating anti-Catholic prejudices? Why is he and many others unaware that they believe in myths? Why has their belief in, in science not led them to examine their beliefs using the scientific method? The answer is that they're all victims of the illusory truth effect, which oddly enough arises from scientific research and then scientific sport to the old maxim, when a lie is repeated often enough, it becomes to be believed as truth. Now before I go any further, you may think I'm defending the Catholic Church through criticising the Protestant churches. However, as you, can, as you will see as we go on, the Anglican Church stands co-accused in the of murder and the abuse of infants in their care alleged to have happened through starvation in Ireland. I am in fact defending science and reason, I'm not defending uh, anything else. Here is a daily mirror stating emphatically that children were starved to death in the Bethany home for unmarried mothers for children in Rathgar in Dublin. There is no hint that the claims might be allegations and that they were proven in a court of law. Move on. There it is, if you can see that on, on the camera. It says here, a care home where babies were starved to death and links to the most senior leaders of the Church of Ireland, the Irish Daily Mail can reveal. Starved to death, here is another headline. So if we zoom in on that, yeah, that's more or less saying the same thing. Not to leave uh, the, the Protestants on their own, of course the Daily Mail or some other paper I think they're saying that nuns starved, uh, babies were starved to death by nuns. Now, Victoria, Wright, Victoria White writing in the examiner claims that the Protestant women who ran the home slaughtered babies. Slaughtered them was the exact word which she used. There it is. There was slaughter, no less. Bethany, like Chum, was not exclusively a home for unmarried mothers. They were also used as refuges for women and their children. Such information has to be hidden from view. Has to be hidden from view. The Chum Children's Home is the name that was used in all the historical sources, but it has been falsely renamed the Chum Mother and Baby Homes in, in recent times to suit nefarious purposes. There is an old saying that if don't use your own mind, Others will use it for you. As we progress forward, I hope to show you who are using those unused minds and those of the gullible. The foundation stone of false belief in Ireland can be traced back to the failures in the history curriculum in particular and the education system in general. However, when we look for the fundamental causes of these failure, it points to the existence of what scholars who study post-colonial societies call the colonial mentality. A colonial mentality is the internalised attitude of ethnic or cultural inferiority felt by people as a result of colonisation. It corresponds with the belief that 
that the cultural values of the colonizer are inherently superior to one's own. Think about that for a moment. There is ample evidence within Irish society to show that they think the British are superior and they will copy the Brits no matter what. Recently, while copying the Brits with regard to teacher assigned grades, the Irish copycats, two steps behind, managed to dodge a major bullet when the British system fell flat on its face, only to fall flat on their own face thanks to the Canadians. Can nobody in Ireland write a computer algorithm that can work out grades, so they have to turn to the Canadians? When the NHS, where is it? Oh, let me skip that. When the NHS has patients on trolleys, the HSE tries to, to have twice as many. Here we have patients in NHS hospitals on the floor when they ran out of trolleys. On the floor, hasn't happened in Ireland yet, but I'd say we're not far behind. Uh, why, why would they ever dream of copying the French, the Germans, the Swiss, or anybody apart from their colonial masters? They always copy the Brits. Not only does the colonial ma mentality include a belief in British superiority, its corollary is that of Irish inferiority. However, there's more to it. I will cite another example to illustrate this point. Here we have two ladies walking outside, number 56 St. Stephen Green. It was the former home of the Earl of Meath and it was purchased in 1834 on behalf of the Sisters of Charity and turned into St. Vincent Hospital. Later adjacent properties were purchased and to expand the hospital. Not many people know this, but Florence Nightingale applied to work with the Sisters not once but twice, first in 1844, and she visited Dublin in 1852 to find the hospital closed for renovations. The reason she wanted to come to Ireland and work with the sisters was to learn nursing craft from the best nurses in the world. Her first mission to the Crimea was the result of a letter published in the Times of London written by a soldier complaining about the dirty and dingy hospitals that British had to, do, had to endure, while the French had clean and well-managed hospitals. In the very letter, he emphasised the point by saying, why have we no sisters of charity? As a result of that letter, Florence was dispatched to Scuteri with a contingent of nurses, 14 Anglican nurses, 14 lay nurses, and 10 Catholic nurses who were also known, nuns. An Irish sister, you can see her circle there, uh, Mary Claire Moore was the chief executive officer of the mission. She managed to bring a level business head to counterbalance the more excitable Florence. Yet the British boast of how they invented good nursing practice through Florence Nightingale. At the end of her mission, the British establishment sought to organise events to boastfully celebrate her achievements. To her great credit, she avoided the ruckus and surreptitiously travelled back into England to avoid the self-aggrandising bluster of her country people, dismissing it as fuzz buzz. Why has the massive contribution of the Sisters of Charity been written out of history? The Sisters have over two centuries built a world-class hospital and provided the people of Dublin with free and affordable health care. Why are the Irish so ignorant that instead of celebrating the magnificent altruism and thanking the sisters, which would happen in any normal society, we've turned our back on them and pilloried the good sister using falsehoods. Here we have the Sisters of Charity saving wounded men on the battlefield of Gettysburg in 1863. The answer why would they believe in falsehoods? The answer to that is, it reveals a story which is emblematic of an overspill of British social engineering into Ireland. But it also fits well with Irish cultural biases. The British constantly boast of their greatness, taking credit which is not theirs to, cra to, cra to claim, to socially engineer contentment, or more appropriately, mitigate against discontentment within the population against this against establishment. It makes poor people accept their situation while keeping the elite in riches. Recently, the BBC Newsnight programme promised to reveal where the five poorest regions in Northern Europe are located. I was sure at least three of them would be in Ireland. But here, here's what they revealed. Shockingly, they were all in Britain. Every one of them. I couldn't believe it. Four in England and one in Wales. One in Wales. The British social engineering was behind Brexit and it overspilled as much into the smaller Ire exit movement. 
The one thing Ireland could do to mitigate against this overspill of social engineering is to educate its children properly, particularly with regard to history. However, such is the power such is the power of social engineering that ignorance of history is much in evidence and is rife within the Irish political elite and government. The government have proven pretty stupid in matters historical in recent times. Take the apology to the wartime deserters of the Irish army as a good example. Britain, Canada, Australia, South Africa and more countries after the war all acted to ensure people who served their state loyally in times of, of a great crisis would have first called on public service jobs. In contrast to the, to the Irish government, the British government was never so stupid to apologise to the 100,000 people who deserted the British army during World War II. Neither has any other government acted so stupidly and apologised to the armed forces defenders. It's clear and unambiguous evidence of the Irish self-hate and it permeates all the way to the top. The commemoration of the centenary of the first all was ruled by comments by Taoiseach Leo Varadkar. He mentioned that the mother and baby homes, setting up as the primary failure of Dáil Éireann in its first 100 years of existence. Kate O'Connell TV stated in the Dáil Chambers that we murder children through abuse and neglect. This is our Holocaust, declared Councillor Cohor, Sinn Féin Councillor, City on Galway City Council at the time. Holocaust, no less. Now, a peculiar thing in Ireland being Ireland, he was also a secondary school teacher in where else but the Jesuit College in Galway. The killing fields of tune screamed the Derry Journal and also the Sunday World. Killing fields, whoa. Excitable headlines sell newspapers. But one has to ask, why in historical debate, debate are there no historians? When the tomb story broke in 2014, a Dutch TV crew flew to Ireland and out of all our historians in all of the country, they could only find Dermot Ferreter. In the interview, Ferreter gave many big hints but revealed nothing of, sub of substance, but was emphatic on one point. He was certain that the children were not buried in a septic tank in tomb. Claire Byrne on RT asked him only last year, was he still certain of this? And he replied, I'm not sure. Where were all the rest of the historians? Any historical debate, there are historians on either side. Why in this particular debate is there no one? There's only one or two academic historians. I considered waging in on the deserters controversy, but that would have been a waste of breath, as the clowns had already taken over the circus. It was a fait accompli. The sheer amount of work which would have been necessary to get the truth across massively outweighed any benefit which might accrue. This could also account for the dearth of historians in the mother and baby homes debate. But I also surmise there is a lack of specialist knowledge within the Irish academic history. There appears to be very few, if any, historians trained in the history of science, the history of medicine, or statistical analysis. I've made a couple of important points here, which are the foundation of my thesis, and at this point I want to state them for reasons of clarity. The present day prejudices have deep roots that go back far, time, far in time. As Char Charlotte Bronte eloquently puts it, prejudices, it is well known, are most difficult to eradicate from the heart whose soil has never been loosened or fertilised by education. They grow firm there, firm as weeds among the stones. There you have it, education is a weed killer. Education protects people from the effects of ignorance, but that protection has been withheld from the Irish people. The government toned down the teaching of history in the 1980s because it feared that it was driving people to enlist in the IRA. The law of unintended consequences has since taken over, with the result that young people today are almost ignorant of the history of their own people. Into the mix are cultural prejudices. Begrudgery is perhaps the best known Irish cultural prejudice in Ireland. However, just one, it's just one prejudice representing the tip of the iceberg. Begrudgery, as the name suggests, is where people envy the success of others. It is a way of cutting down, putting other people down, which is done to create a feeling of superiority. It has the net effect psychologically of placing them beneath your social level. It's a form of social pretentiousness. That pretending that pretentiousness, that means pretending to be something one isn't. It's a common behaviour observable in all societies, but it's especially acute in Irish society 
due to the ancestral history of poverty and the non-existent social mobility. If you hate the Irish and all things Irish, and you are Irish, it's a form of self-hate. Michael McDowell famously labelled Fintan O'Toole as a self-hater, the journalist, because of the many articles he wrote attacking the Irish nation. O'Toole replied with his typical egocentricity, saying that he not only did he not hate himself, but he loved himself and loved himself dearly. Every day in the Irish media you can witness the Irish attacking themselves. It's a deep inset bias born in begrudgery, a manifestation of the pretentiousness of one's ancestors. It's an action which makes people feel big without ever having to achieve any social, real social advancement. The Irish self-hate is built into the terms of reference for the Commission of Investigation into the Mother and Baby Homes. They are prevented from, from comparing the brutal system of care for unmarried mothers under the British, which was replaced with infinitely more benevolent system when the workhouses were got rid of in 1922, post-1922. Denigrating people living, living people outside of politicians is a very precarious endeavour, especially in this present-day litigation society. So deep is our need for illusory social advancement that the Irish have had to go back in time to denigrate the dead. When slandering the dead, one is unlikely to, to end up to end up in a court accused of defamation. It fulfills a need for small people to feel big. This is how significant numbers of the Irish population have behaved for century, centuries and continues today. And in spite of the advancement in education and attainment, this explanation might go some way to answering three big questions of observers of 21st century Irish society. Why do people want to believe in information which is obviously false? Why do people create falsehoods What's in it for them? Why have the Irish nation of the 21st century gone back and picked a fight with the dead? There has been a decline in former religions throughout Europe in recent decades, and Ireland has not been immune. The church was seen earlier by Irish societies as necessary for long-term salvation and was protected accordingly by society. However, it is now seen as a paragon of Irishness and accordingly it has been inducted into the Irish institution of self-hate. It is again a result of a major failure within the education system. Religion for a lot of people today is seen as backward and evil. Many people accept these false notions without question and they give them the because it gives them the feeling of social superiority. Accordingly, they are difficult to displace. False notions which have the beguiling power to increase one's own image of social standing and self-worth, which can be achieved with no effort, are difficult to resist for some people. Over only 7% of all the wars in history had religion as their cause. 93% had secular causes, yet secularism is not under attack. Because many people hold the false belief that religion was the cause of most wars. One of my daughter's science teachers at St. Andrews College in Galway told the class that there was no scientific evidence for the existence of God. I don't think the subject of the existence of God was actually on the curriculum, so he's expressing a personal opinion to the class. It demonstrates that many people know little about the fundamentals of science, and that includes many science teachers. The lack of ability, that lack of ability translates into a poor public understanding of basic statistics and medical terminology. Would you believe the ESRI in a survey found that 10% of Irish people did not understand what a percentage was? That means one in ten of you have no idea what I just said. The lack of mathematical understanding is, more, more, is one more foundation stone of the false history. For example, just take this hypothetical. Say University College Hospital in Galway has more people suffering from cardiac problems than the Galway Clinic. More people die in there than do in the private Galway Clinic. If you had cardiac problems, which hospital would you choose based on the statistics? I think most of you will be inclined to go to the Galway Clinic. We have a natural tendency to equate higher mortality rates with poor care. Did you know that 50% of doctors qualified in their final exams with marks which were below the class average? How do you know that? Maybe these people got, got all the jobs in the hospitals with the high mortality rates. 
It's an assumption which we use naturally. But it's not only wrong, but dead wrong. Don't tell that to the public and keep it from the journalists because they will not be able to make a living making up false stories through the misinterpretation of statistics. A hospital with a high mortality rate for cardiac problems has a specialist cardiac unit. 36 patients are sent to it, usually in a big hurry. If they die, their death is registered at the specialist unit, not the hospital which first admitted them. A high mortality rate is an indication of nothing. All hospitals which deal with high-risk patients have higher mortality rates. There is nothing untoward in that statistic. If 50% of doctors finish below the class average, the other 50% finished above the class average. That's what average is. It's a central, central, a measure of central tendency. Yet, how often is, it, is the phrase above average and below average used to manipulate opinions? Many people don't, aren't aware of it. Let's move on. Sorry, I'm, I'm still behind the wrong button. Okay. So what is the reality when we look at mortality statistics? Here we have one here, and note the top two. The old people are, are fairly well represented there. About 500,000 in each category, from 65 to 74 and 75 up. So we add those together, it's a million. How about the deaths of children under five, which I've deliberately blanked out here, what would you say is the number of children? Well, I'll reveal it now. Two million. In an earlier time, young children died, much more young children died than even the whole rest of the population. Children, uh, young babies, particularly infants, are so subject to uh, higher rates of mortality, and that has been the case up until the 1960s in most countries in the world. Here is a statistic which was a graph that was produced by the CSO to commemorate 1916 and it shows the differences. Look at the differences under one. The green is 2014 and the purple represents 1916. You can see there in the one to four category, nobody died. There's not, maybe there's one or two, but in those which was, but if we need to compare it with the past, it's the deaths under five is the way it was recorded. So I'll take that and I'll, I'll put it up here. Okay, now you can see the comparison. Nearly as many children died under the age of five as died in the, the as died in 2014 in the 65 to 74 year, and even in the 75 to 84. Old people you would expect to die, but they were vastly outnumbered by children. The high infant mortality rate was noticed all over the world. There was very little they could do with it at certain times. This is one from New York. Mothers, there is a way to stop the awful death rate among children in the crowded residence parts of the city. Children were dying all over the place. Here's another one from London. In London in 1911, 3,000 babies died in a month. In Paris, they were dying at the rate of 250 a week, a third of it. What was the cause? Very simple. What has been the biggest killer of children in history, and it continues to kill thousands of children, hundreds of thousands of children today, it was, of course, the baby's bottle. Children who have no mothers to feed them and are reliant on the bottle, there's lack of nutrition and there's a whole lot of other things. And you see, during hot weather, it was very difficult to preserve milk, and the milk would go off and uh, become poisons almost, very quickly, and that was the simple fact that was what was killing a lot of children. On top of that, infants face even more danger from social conditions like poverty. The conditions of poverty which once existed in, in parts of Ireland still exist in parts of the world today. And it comes as no surprise to any competent social researcher that high infant mortality rates are associated with poverty. And that can be found in the richest country in the world. Here you have a headline from Newsweek. Washington's poorest infants are 10 times more likely to die than the richest. The primary evidence put forward as of abuse and starvation is the appearance of the word marasmus. Now you can see it underlined there, marasmatic. This is again Victoria White writing in the same article in the uh, Irish Examiner. It has been repeated many times, including in the Guardian and all the rest of it. Marasmus is the chief 
found on, on, on a death certificate is what the chiefly accused used to accuse the, the nuns and the Protestant women of murder. Now here we have an extract from the Re Registrar General's report from 1919. You can see here what the medical profession think marasmus is, as opposed to what Victoria White and others think it is. It's a developmental and wasting disease. And the three of them are there, atrophy, debility, and marasmus. However, the significance uh, of marasmus as a killer of infants is, the, however, this is significant. Marasmus was a killer of infants in maternity hospitals outside of mother and baby homes. Here is a certificate of, and I think there's a circle to go on there. Here's a certificate with Marasmus on it. And it's from the Adelaide Protestant Hospital, as you notice there. So the Adelaide uh, Hospital, which is a Protestant hospital, mentioned by, by you earlier, it's now amalgamated into Tala Hospital. But here's evidence of murder, slaughter at the Adelaide Hospital. Let's move on. Here we have Marasmus again. This time, it's at Temple Street Hospital, Temple Street Children's Hospital. Murder taking place there. Here we have another case of Marasmus, which was actually a child died at home and has been certified by a medical profession. Not the use of the word certified. That means a doctor has visited the home and has certified that the child has suffered from Marasmus and subsequently when it died, it was certified as having died as Marasmus. Here is the famous Rotunda Hospital, Two cases of murder there as well. Now, if the journalists are going to use Marasmus as a, a basis for jumping to the conclusion that the nuns and everybody else murder children, well, then they're going to have to go and accuse everybody in all maternity hospitals and all maternity homes because there are cases of Marasmus in every single one of them. Now, why is it that the great professor, Dermot Ferreter, and the likes of them did not go and do any research and find this out? I did this sitting on my bum, because it's available online. And they didn't even bother to go and look at that. And that's one of the prime problems we hear, a major failure of the quality control mechanisms within history, that none of the historians who were highly paid got off their bum and went to look for evidence to support or disconfirm the, the claims that were being made in the public domain. Now here's one where, uh, if you came across this one. Here is an advertisement for the cure of Marasmus. Now if Marasmus is starvation, as they're trying to make out, why is there a cure for it? Surely it's food, or adequate food. So the story is that it wasn't. This one here is an inquest uh, that was done on an old child. Now I've got this and it's not very good, so i have overread it here. So this is an important one. The jury have found death from Marasmus was the verdict returned at an inquest held at St. Patrick's Stone Hospital on the body of a child named Donnelly, nine months old, off Thorncastle Street, Rings End. The coroner said, in consequence of the condition of the child, then it, when it was brought to the hospital, the surgeon was of the opinion that it died from starvation. But the post-mortem showed that death was due to natural causes. The child had been under treatment for six months, from July to January, in the children's hospital in Harcourt Street, and had not seemed to improve, and had to be treated by Dr. Crichton. Dr. Hogan, the house surgeon, stated that it was due to marasmus, the child not being able to assimilate nourishment given to it. The jury found in accordance with the evidence. So instead of starvation being recorded on the death certificate, what's recorded? Marasmus. By the way, an inquest is a coroner's inquiry. All unexplained deaths have to go through, go through the coroner, and the coroner sets up a court, if necessary, to get a jury to determine the cause of death. So this was determined by a jury, not by anybody else. Unexplained deaths all have to be reported to the coroner. Such failures are not recent in Irish academia. It has been failing for decades. The situation has become so bad that even young academics believe in the falsehoods and broadcast false history to their students and to the world. Here's an article written by Dr. Sarah Ann Buckley, published in 2016, by the Jacobean, an American left-wing magazine. Dr. Berkeley works as a lecturer here in Galway at the university's Department of History. In this article, this article is notable for many elementary errors and is a classic of the genre of weaponized history. 
as you can see there, the Catholic cure for poverty. As I said earlier, the Protestant Church in Ireland stands co-accused of abuse and murder, while other Protestant dominated countries, dominated countries also operated mother and baby homes. The singling out of Catholics in the title should ring warning bells in the minds of historiographers that this article is not attempting impartial history. The, ex the experts should be able to spot problems right away. But what chance of the common people? They will surely be influenced by the author's credentials and place of work which are displayed at the bottom of the article. I would pick out two bold claims within the article and put them to the test. In my book, I go through this in more detail. But she says, women were banned from sitting on juries. That's the exact quote from the article. What was the reality? The Juries Act Amendment 1924, every woman Oh, this section applies is qualified and liable to serve as a juror on an administrative county or county borough shall be entitled, if she so desires, to be entered into the register of electors for the registration, shall to be entered in the registration of electors for the registration area comprising such a municipal county borough as exempt. So she could write in and say to the, the registrar, I want to be exempt from duty jury. That's not a ban. It was amended a few years later because obviously they were sending out jury summonses to a lot of women and a lot of them were saying, oh, I don't serve on it, you know, be gone. So were, it was the Juries Act of 1927. Persons exempted but entitled, entitled to serve on application were women on the basis of their sex alone. Women could apply to sit, to, they were entitled to sit on it and they could apply. So instead of being opted in, Sorry, instead of opting out, now they had to opt in if they wanted to do it. And that was just a cut down on paperwork. But Sarah Buckley tells us they were banned. They were never banned. That's a lie. And she's not, she's not making that lie up herself. She's repeating it from other people. Uh, it's been going around for decades. And there's one other uh, example I want to give you. Women were prevented from occupations unsuited to their sex. Were they? That's what she says, emphatically. Women were prevented from mocking patients suited to their sex. That's a common canard that's in, in, in Ireland. Let's see what the Constitution actually says. The state shall endeavour to ensure the strength and health of workers, men, women, and tender age of children shall not be abused, and that the citizens shall not be forced by economic necessity to enter avocations unsuited to their sex, age, or strength. Why is only women singled out? Were men not banned from doing work unsuited to their sex? It doesn't say anything about it. It says forced by economic necessity. That's not making preventing women from uh, occupations unsuited to their sex. Article 41 too is another one which the feminists uh, uh, presently don't like. The state shall therefore endeavour to ensure that mothers shall, be, and shall not be obliged by economic necessity to engage in labour to the neglect of their duties in the home. Now, the feminists don't particularly like that, that one. The latter clause about women being, uh, let me see. There you have it. Not only is misogyny not present, but misandry also, if you want to interpret it that way, is hatred of men. Of course it's not true. And this falsehood has been used up to prop up many major falsehoods that Irish society was misogynist. It hated women. If anything, the, site, the, the society was phylogynist. It loved women and it sought to protect them. That can be clearly seen in the Constitution and elsewhere. Anyone can make a mistake, and it is clear that due to her inexperience, this historian has simply repeating false history, which should have been discarded decades ago, and would not have had, it would not have been there if Irish academia had a functioning quality control system. Also, there is a fear within, within the system Historiographers fear to challenge feminist historians. Life is just too short, and there's no chance of reason prevailing over an emotional diatribe. The latter clause about women being forced to work outside the home has become the subject of feminist ire in recent years, but it has been of great benefit to the nation. My wife decided to stay at home and become a full-time mother. I got her tax-free allowance. Charlie McCreevy, the Minister of Finance, was forced by this clause to bring in an extra tax-free allowance for families which I benefit from. Women today are forced to work outside the home through economic necessity, whether they want to or not, due to the high rents and 
property prices. If people were clever, they could use this clause to force the government to provide affordable housing. Finally, I would finish on this story. Some decades ago, a woman wrote to the Prime Minister asking him for permission to have her profoundly disabled son killed off. She even referred to him in the letter as the little monster. On receiving the letter, the Prime Minister called in his personal doctor and asked for his opinion. The doctor advised that the child should be put to death and that all disabled people in the care homes were a burden on the state and they should be killed off too. So began the mass killing of disabled people in care homes. The program was known as Action T4 and the doctor was named Carl Brandt, who was later executed for this crime at the Nuremberg trials. The Prime Minister, I call the Prime Minister, just put you off, was Adolf Hitler. And the T4 referred to the number of building where his office was located, number four, Tiergartenstrasse. Eventually, word got round of the killings in the care homes, and while everyone was afraid to speak out, the Catholic Bishop of Munster, Clement August Graf von Gallen, bravely denounced Hitler from the pulpit. It caused such uproar that Hitler backed down and the Action T program in T4 program in care homes was ended. Hitler effectively got a belt of a Catholic closure. The ban of euthanasia is a fundamental principle of Catholicism. I want to leave you with this one final thought. Any woman, any man, doctors, nurses, nuns, politicians, etc., who are running a baby slaughtering service in Ireland, there is no doubt about it whatsoever. They too, like Adolf Hitler, would have got a belt of a Catholic closure. Thank you very much. Did you feel the meter, Rory? You're not using this, are you? Uh, no, I don't okay. think of that, unfortunately.